and the reason I started playing music is that I thought it could change the world. This is my guitar, Mama Brown, and for decades, we've traveled the world playing a mix of socially conscious, politically charged rap, reggae, and acoustic music. I've played in nightclubs and festivals and stadiums and street corners. I played for prisoners in Folsom and San Quentin, I've played in protests and in war zones. And in 2004, I went to Iraq and played on the streets of Baghdad for US soldiers and Iraqi civilians alike. I spent over 20 years on the road before I ever had a song in the top 20. And together with my band Spearhead, we've sold millions of records. The very best part of what I do is that I get to meet tons of people every single day who are trying to survive in an incredibly challenging world. It's hard. It's really, really hard sometimes just to get by and to hold on to your humanity, you know, your dignity, your pride, your heart, your soul, and to feel like you have a sense of purpose in this world. We define being human by those things, but sometimes it's hard to hold on to those things and to stay human. You gave me hope today. Thank you. The world is fucked right you now. You gave me hope today. You guys ready? Yeah. yeah. Jumping in this too? OK, Yeah, but go. it's facing the other way. Oh, uh, uh oh <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice. I discovered you last year. You were playing with Stevie Wonder at a three-day concert. Yes, at Bottle Rock. And I fell in love with you. Oh, thank you, Peggy. <laughs> You're welcome. Ten months of chemo is over. I, I'm not through yet. You're not. You're not through yet. I can get through it now. You can get through it. Thank Got you this. so much. Yeah. Hi. How's it going? Of course, I want the rest of your fortune. Is it the side of the fortune in it or not? No, she already took that out. What, what's your fortune? At this moment, something is. Someone is thinking positively of you. That was me. <laughs> and now I'm here. <laughs> Do I get a hug? For that? You get a hug. Oh, sweet. What's your favorite song? Uh, Kelly? Say, hey, I'll, I'll be gone, gone today, and I'll, I'll be back all around the way. Seems like everywhere I go, the more I see, the less I know. And I know one thing, I love you. Yeah. I love Michael Franklin. Ah, I love Kelly. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> so I got married to my wife last year, and and we walked down to life is better with you. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> wife yeah. is better with you. Yeah. 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 Good to see you. So good. How are you, brother? Yeah. I'm doing well. Thank you so much. How you doing, brother? Yeah. Yeah. Are you drumming? 
I brought it. You brought your drum? Yeah, I did. Oh, let's, we gotta get you up there and yeah, play with sure, us. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I meet people um, being their most human, being, you know, sad, happy, joyful. I mean, black, white, gay, straight, every kind of profession, every kind of religion. What's your name? Aaron. Nice to meet Mommy. you, Aaron. Mommy. She's, she's a little foster Daddy. baby from Alameda yeah. County. All right oh, on. No, I was a foster yeah. baby from so Alameda County you. before. <laughs> so are you guys thinking about adopting? Yeah, or? we're just we're waiting trying. Trying. Yeah, we're, uh, we're well, just waiting for the courts to finish their thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. We just pray every day. Well, yeah. you know what? The, the biggest battle you've already won. She said, this is mommy. <laughs> That's it. Game over. <laughs> Drop the mic. Move on. <laughs> yeah. That's mommy. You guys are going to be good. Thank you. It's going to work out. I hope so. It's going to work out. <laughs> I know it will. And you'd think that after all these, you know, decades of doing this and thousands of people that I've met, that I would be one step closer to understanding what it means to be human and to stay human. But... I'm not. I am very, very curious. I've always been like insatiably curious, almost to the point of being manic at times in my life of just trying to figure things out. And, you know, all of us are given these little tools or like gems in life that help us to figure out the world. Like if you're a phys physicist, you're given mathematics, or if you're a doctor, you're given science. And I almost feel sometimes it was like kind of a cruel joke that I was given music. Television, the drug of the nation. You got to put up a fight. You got to put up a fight. How many people never heard you call it? Don't give up on me. See, I've always made socially conscious music, but music as a whole is kind of like this weird paradox because it's something that, on the one hand, has helped me to run away from problems in my life, but it's also been the way that I've searched for um, who I am. Almost everywhere I go, I see a, a battle taking place in the world. It's not a battle between left and right or between religious affiliations and nations. No. The battle taking place today is between cynicism and optimism. And I know it's out there because I feel it in myself too. For almost 30 years, I've been making music that I had hoped would make a small difference. But do you ever wake up and feel like the world is completely fucked? And no matter what you do or how hard you try, you couldn't possibly make it any better than the way it is right now. Throughout the years, I've met people whose lives collided with mine at precisely the right moments when I needed inspiration when I was questioning my sense of purpose. These are the stories of people I met along the way, people who've inspired me, people who made me think differently about my life, my music, and what it means to stay human. Robin Lim is a midwife that I met in 2007 in New Kuning, Bali. And in 1995, she opened a natural birthing center there at the request of locals who had seen her deliver her own babies at home. And since that time, she's been traveling around the world helping moms have their babies. When I first met Robin Lim in Ubud, Bali, uh, she just amazed me with her spirit. When the tsunami hit in Aceh, she went to Aceh and set up a clinic there. After the earthquake hit in Haiti, she went to Haiti and set up a birthing clinic there. Now she's here in Tacloban, Philippines, taking over a birthing center here. 
Like the Filipino people, she embodies the word tenacity. Everything looked like they'd put everyone's dreams in a blender and put it on high speed and destroyed everything. But then I looked to one side and the sun is setting. And to stand there with people who've lost everything, their homes, some of them have lost all of their family, and we're looking at the sunset together, and they're saying, wow, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Our planet is really beautiful, and our universe is really beautiful. On November 7, 2013, Typhoon Yolanda struck the Philippines with wind speeds peaking at 195 miles per hour. It displaced millions of people, left hundreds of thousands homeless, and over 6,000 confirmed dead. Although survivors of the typhoon say the death toll was much higher. We got here and we started doing feeding people, tarps, uh, bolo knives so this people is, could make houses. This is right after the... This is right after the uh, Typhoon Yolanda, which is also known as Typhoon Haiyan, which is the biggest storm that has ever made landfall in human history. I have no house. You have no house? Uh, not what house. Your house is taken away. I got to Tacloban three months after the storm had hit. All the world's media and most of the relief agencies had already pulled out, leaving the people living in ruins. Tell me about what happened when the typhoon came. Well, it's happened so fast, and, and we can run because the ship is, you know, bumping our house. The ship bumped into your house? Yeah. Wow. We're all scared. Everyone's screaming, and, I, and we don't know what to do. We're thankful that we're complete, our family. Yeah, your whole family's still alive. Yeah. During the typhoon, three massive waves came up here and swept away all the people that homes that were living here. And as you can see, it brought up several boats onto the shore that they're trying to get moved out of here. And each day, they're finding about 25 bodies. Today, they just found three right here. So this little school, uh, as you walked around on the little campus, you could see that it was really this beautiful little ideal community center, a safe space for children, a creative space for children, a fun space for children. And if 14.6% of the general population of this entire country are pregnant, imagine how many births are happening. Jenny gave birth to this baby girl with her husband helping. You're going to be a good dad, huh? What happens when all infrastructure in society breaks down, the pregnant women still have to have a place to have a baby. And that gets forgotten. What I see as a midwife and what I see as a mother and a grandmother is that we are intentionally medically separating mother and child at birth. And when we do that, we cause a trauma that's so deep and so difficult to heal that most of humanity is spending 30 years or more just healing their trauma. There's something really cool here that we do is we don't cut the cord right away. So you see the placentas here. Do you have some flowers, Michael? Yeah. This is for the placenta. And why don't you cut the placenta right away? Because the baby's uh, still getting some, at the f in the first few minutes, the baby's getting oxygen, iron, ex um, the full blood supply that belongs to her. And then afterwards, it's more of a, just a wait and see. The stem cells have now moved into the baby, and now it's just a spiritual thing to give the mother a chance to bond to the baby and breastfeed. So this baby can be more intelligent and healthier. We like to think about how, what does baby really feel and support for the baby to feel completely secure. And without trauma, the baby can then live their optimal life with an in intact capacity to love and trust. They average about three to five births a day at the clinic, and because travel is so difficult for most women, Robin makes house calls almost every day. Wow! Congratulations. What's your baby's name? Dwayne Webb. Dwayne Webb. Yeah. Almost like Dwayne yeah, Wade, the basketball player. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You like Dwayne Wade? No, my yes, but. <laughs> Being gonna eat my hand. You're so hungry all the time. You better not make you eat constantly. So uh, by tomorrow or the next day, you'll start changing your mouth. Will become more 
more milk and this would be her. Uh, if it gets very hard, you take the luya, ginger, luya. grate it, put hot water and make compress. Mm -hmm. We have 100% breastfeeding at Bumi Sehat because we're obsessed. We midwives, we go visit the moms at home. I don't care if they live in a palace or shack, we visit them. We make sure that no one's sneaking that baby bottles. We make sure the mom has good nutrients. We make sure she has the best vitamins in the world. Why is it important for you that they go to school? To make their own dream come true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the sound of sunshine coming down, coming down. That's the sound of sunshine coming down. What is it that gives you the strength when you feel that you're coming up against these barriers? What gives you the tenacity to push through? Stubbornness. Must be my Lola, my grandmother, <laughs> my Filipino grandmother. She was receiving babies in the mountains during World War II when there were no hospitals. The hospitals were bombed out, the hospitals, but she could take one sweet potato and she could feed every refugee. She just used a lot of water and salt and just kind of stone soup, whatever herbs she could pick. And she tried to keep people alive and well, so. But did you saw those kids, you sang to those kids. You would do anything for them. And you know what, they would do anything for you. Sometimes a setback is a blessing because for me, it makes me think, wow, that person actually thinks they can stop this vision and this mission. I'm gonna prove them wrong. The uh, World Food Plan has something they call HEBs, high energy biscuits. And uh, we knew they had a warehouse. For, we even saw the warehouse tent full of them. And we knew that the people here at Mercy we're seeing almost 400 pregnant women, and none of them had food, and none of them had food for a couple weeks already. So we were really concerned about the permanent damage to the babies, not let alone the mothers. Mariam has been working here too. She, she uh, sent me a text, she said, there's a woman named Fiona, and she's staying in the hotel yeah, waterfront, waterfront. waterfront in, Cebu. in Cebu. So we basically moved in on her. I told Fiona, I said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to move in with you. I'm going to live in your hotel room. I hope you like me <laughs> because I am going to bug you and stay here until I get the paper so I can go get the biscuits. So we left there with a her car loaded to the ceiling and the trunk with yeah. biscuits. And we were like, the biscuits were like, <laughs> and then we heard later that the World Food Plan calls us the biscuit bitches. <laughs> the Filipinos. I think we are a resilient type of people. And the thing is, uh, whatever comes our way, whether it's going to rain really hard or the earthquake will hit us, Filipinas would always manage to smile at the end of the day. When a baby has an uh, impaired capacity to love and trust, the research proves that person holds back. That person really can't live their optimal humanity. Give a child a chance to express all of their gifts, you know, the epigenesis of who they can be. And who I believe each human being can be is an earth keeper. When a person can really love, can really share love, can really receive love, and really takes care of other people, of animals, of trees, of the earth mother, that person is becoming the steward of our air and our land and our water. So I want to live in the planet populated by people who were born gently. Do you ever feel like quitting? Do you ever feel like giving up? Quite. <laughs> I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. So we will fight. Rebuild our place. You know, being around Robin, 
and holding a newborn baby just reminds me of my own birth and my own childhood and the way that I grew up. And also being around Robin, you just are constantly reminded that life is so unexpected. Things can just happen at any time. This summer, I had a reminder of that. I was on tour and performing night after night. My knee started hurting. And then one day, it just completely gave out. All right, Michael, sweet dreams. We'll see you in a little bit. Now you just gotta heal and get better and get back on the road. Good luck. <laughs> well, you look good. Thanks, babe. <laughs> I did. He texted out? me. I didn't talk to me. I just walked in. Okay. So he texted me a picture of the of your femur. Did you hear that it's shaped like a heart? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, "Of course, your cartilage damage will be shaped like a heart." Hey, Mom. Hi. How are you doing? I'm just, just got home from having coffee, and I was getting ready to take some garbage out. <laughs> I wish I was there to help you. <laughs> yeah, well, so how are you? Uh, I've been better. Yeah, what's going on? Um, well, just, you know, just my knee is worse than what I was anticipating, so. Oh, gosh. Just kind of bummed out. You know, that's not good. But at least you're in a good place where they'll do the best they can. Yeah, no, I'm like in the right place, surrounded by great people. You know. Yeah, maybe you're gonna have to change your lifestyle a little bit, you think? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have more. I've always said, put your eggs in more than one basket. <laughs> Maybe this yeah. is the time to think about that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can't be the running around like I used to be. Yeah. And I miss that. Yeah. What is the prognosis? Originally, there was some cartilage that had broken off my femur, and... It was like two pieces the size of a dime, but you oh, went in there yeah. and instead of finding two little pieces of cartilage, there was literally hundreds of shards, like tiny grains of rice, basically, of just cartilage. Oh, gosh. Well, you're, you have a healthy heart, I hope, and a healthy mind. And, yep. And you'll adapt, you're creative. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'm still the same dude, so. I'm just... You're still the same dude, yeah. yeah. Um, you can still exert the same positive energy in those around you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing is, like, with the physical pain, it, 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 it lasts for a while, but I get bummed out. Like, I'm prone to depression. I grew up in this unique family, and I was adopted when I was seven months old. My birth mother is Irish, German, and Belgian. My birth father is African American and Nottaway Indian from the mountains of Virginia. I was adopted by Charles and Carol Franti, who were second generation immigrants from Finland. They were dreamers. They came to this country seeking a better life. They had three kids of their own. Then they adopted myself and another African-American son. All of his kids were very different. We were different sizes and shapes and colors and different sexual identities. And like any family, sometimes we got along, sometimes we didn't. Our mom, Mrs. Franti, was a public school teacher. And our dad, Mr. Franti, was a professor of biostatistics and epidemiology and was an avid woodcarver and loved to fish. But he lived with a lot of pain and was a very introverted man. And that pain drove him into alcoholism. And when he drank when I was a kid, 
it seemed like he had only two emotions, silence and rage. I felt like an outsider growing up. Like, I, I didn't feel like even like I fit in with the family that I was in. Like, it's not in my nature to be an introverted person, but there I was in this family of people who kept everything bottled up inside. I would sit in my room and, like, dream of the way I wanted to see my life. You know, I was born in the late 60s in the height of the racial tension of the civil rights movement. And one of the reasons I was given up for adoption is because my birth mom's father was very racist, and she felt that he would never accept me coming out of the box, being a brown baby. So she did what she felt was the best thing to give me up, but it still hurts me. It still brings me an incredible amount of pain to know that she gave me away because of racism. I have empathy for you, and I have empathy for your parents who, who went out of their way to adopt these two children, mm -hmm. you know, during a really challenging time. I felt this, like, affinity with other people in the world who felt like outsiders, who were either that way because of their ethnicity or their sexuality or just because they felt different in some w whatever way. And, and so I wrote aggressive social political music. But at that time, that was all I knew how to do. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really figured out how to put what I was feeling emotionally inside into my music or really be able to express it in my personal life. In 2013, I met a couple named Hope and Steve December, and they taught me a lot about the importance of communicating what's in my heart. And I remember at the time, there was the ALS challenge. <laughs> but Steve was living the real ALS challenge. And I promise to fight. Yeah, I promise to fight. And do all that I can. And do all that I can. To stay here on this earth. To stay here on this earth. With you as long as God is will allow. With you as long as God will allow. So I see. So I see, take you hope, take you hope, to be my wife, to be my wife, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live, as long as we both shall live, with my faith and confidence in God, my faith and confidence in God, to you I pledge my life, to you I pledge my life. For three years, Steve December was misdiagnosed with a pre-existing hockey injury in his wrist. In August 2011, Steve was diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. I first met Steve and Hope December on Twitter. Hope started saying to me, my husband has ALS, and he'd really like to come to one of your shows as he may be dying soon. And the next day, we met them and saw Steve in a wheelchair. He was almost completely paralyzed, could barely speak in whispers. But his positivity shined through so much. And during the show, I brought Steve and Hope onto the stage. And at one point, Steve asked Hope to lift him up out of his wheelchair. And he said he wanted to dance and in front of 20,000 people. They danced together and there wasn't a dry eye in the whole place. Steve is probably the most passionate, driven person you'll ever meet in your life. He is determined to live life as much as he can. I was drawn to him and it was like an instant connection. And I remember him telling me after our first date that he said, you know, this time I wasn't letting you walk out. He was having health problems the whole time, but we never really thought it was anything serious. When he was going through the diagnosis, he was asking me, you know, if it turns out to be something serious, will you stay with me? You don't have to, you know, I'm okay if you leave, but if not, will you please marry me? Ring and all. And I said, of course, I will marry you. And then fast forward, we planned the wedding in two months and it was perfect. 
ALS is Lou Gehrig's disease, and in medical terms, it's a motor neuron disease that attacks your nerves in your spinal cord. Essentially, it's you go to bed one day and you're fine. You wake up the next day and you can't use your hand. And then maybe a month later, you can't use your arm. And then a few months down the road, you can't walk. And it slowly robs a person of their physical body to the point where it takes their breathing on their own, their speech, their eating. So it is probably the worst diagnosis you can get. When diagnosed with ALS, doctors gave Steve three to five years to live. There is no known cure for Lou Gehrig's disease. What is it like when you just have something to say and you can't get it out? And you can't hope, can't understand you. What, what, what's that like? It is because no, be b e y beyond frustrating. It's beyond frustrating for probably both of us. I hate that I can't communicate the way you used to. So you've got to do a lot of really difficult things. You have to suction his, his trach. Yeah. That if it got clogged, or that, you know, he could die at any minute. Yeah. Suffocate. What was that like the first time you had to do that? Uh, I was terrified. Um, we were in the hospital and we had been there for a month, and I told them, I'm not going home until I feel comfortable suctioning him. And the very first time, I just wanted to cry before doing it, but actually, he was talking to me the whole time. He was like, you didn't go deep enough, or go deeper, you can stay in longer. And it was real sweet, like, here I am suctioning him, and he's encouraging me to keep, you know, keep going. Don't yeah. give up hope, you got it. So it was hard, but um, i kind of become an expert at it now. You know, I've, I feel really comfortable that I'm able to, if he needs saved with suctioning, I can do it, you know, which is good. He and I have learned to work together as far as, I gotta have a little bit of me time. So in the mornings I get, I do an hour of yoga and then 30 minutes just to freshen up, shower, make breakfast, tea. But the whole time he stays on the vent. And so if the vent's breathing for him, why doesn't he go on the vent all the time? The more you're on the vent, the more you need to be on the vent. Mm -hmm. So your body kind of just gets used to being on it. Yeah. And he's just not ready to be completely vent dependent. Does he feel like that's just like one step further? In? Yeah, it's definitely one step further. And what are some of the things that you do to feel normal? I wear cologne and I taste, take baths and I taste foods and drinks and I hold you. Yeah, he still cuts me. I leave the room and um, he's either there with a friend or, you know, he's there with a friend or a family member. Uh -huh. And I leave and I come back and they act like nothing happened. And a week later, we get a package delivered to the doorstep. Wow. Or he either bought me some new outfit or trinket or something. Yeah. So you even know his body is even still Steve. Yep. He's still Steve. He's always going to be Steve. Sweet, charming, caring. So what toll has this taken on you guys financially? Well, when I had to ask for help, it was like, you know, I almost felt like I was admitting defeat a little bit. And I've learned a lot that people really want to help us. And I've learned that it's also okay to need help sometimes, you know, it's, we're all human. He's been helping us, and he saw the other one, and he, oh, I can't wait 
need to see Steve's face. It's the eye gaze that Steve was using now. It's working. Let's go get it. Look what you got! I don't even know what to say right now. I'm speechless. I just do what the Lord tells me to do. He told me to bring this to this man right here. Wayne has been trying to help us for a very long time get our Toby work, and it wouldn't work. And he just made it work. This will allow him to Facebook, it'll allow him to change the channels, it'll allow him to make phone calls. You get him a cell phone, you can Bluetooth this to the cell phone. Oh my God. So. Life just got really awesome for you, babe. Just improve things a little bit, that's for sure. <laughs> I am so happy and Oops. Did I do amazed. That? Watch what it'll actually do. And when he hits open in, it actually will type it in there for him and take him to that website. Whoa. And then he can scroll up and scroll down with his eyes. Uh, he has full, full control. So I'm gonna make this your home page. That's so cool. From there, right, now we're typing. We right love now. you so much, Wayne. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, guys. You're welcome. Steve, you're welcome. How are you getting along with this new machine? This thing is fucking awesome. <laughs> it is fucking crazy. It is fucking crazy. I'm just thankful every day that I wake up and he's still there. And just, I'm thankful about what I learned about myself. I was really awkward, probably, a lot. And so when I met Steve, he kind of made me feel happy with who I am and that it was okay to be happy with who I am. Hope is the most selfless person I know. She has dedicated her entire life to helping make others' lives better. She now has taken that passion and directed it at and for me and my health. She is a vibrant woman of the world. I couldn't fight this disease without her dedication, passion, and support. Steve, are you afraid of dying? I was very afraid before, but now I have so no fear at all because I already died once and I know what to expect. Yeah, he said in the very beginning he was very afraid of it. And um, in the hospital, when he coded, he actually died for a good three minutes. So since that happened, he has no more fear of it. He said he knows what to expect. and. When it's his time, it's his time. I have nothing to complain about, ever. I look at a lot of other people, and they oftentimes have a hard time being themselves around us because they're a happy couple, and they have it where, you know, their husband's able to walk or take care of them. And I don't, I don't envy them because I have Steve, you know? It doesn't matter what our life is, and it, we never intended on our lives being we stay in our house all the time. But it is what it is, you know, and you just make the best of it. It's 11.59 and 59 seconds. If I want to die tonight, I want heaven. Hey, hey, with you. It's 11.59 and 59 seconds. If I want to die tonight, I want heaven. Hey, hey. With you, I wanna rock it with you. Throughout all the times I've been around Stephen Ho, I've seen through their courage that all of us have an unlimited capacity to love and to be there for those who need us most. If there is one thing I want everyone to learn from me, it's that when you are struggling to be happy, look at the simple things that God has given you, such as the ability to type, 
breathe, talk, swallow, kiss your wife's significant other and really think about the simple things you have and be happy about them for they can be taken away in an instant. Live your life to the fullest and never take a day for granted. Just be grateful for the simple things and enjoy the gift of life. Steve, I'm gonna say goodbye. If I don't see you again, snow that I like you so much. I hope I do. But if I don't, I just want to make sure that I send that to you. I love you. I care about you. You changed my life. I'm so happy that we were able to get here together. And that you were so gracious to be with us. I think the most important trick is to stay happy. You have to have something to live for, and you gotta want to live. Uh, so you keeping a positive attitude uh, about the worst prognosis you can have uh, is very vital. So um, please stay positive and uh, you know pray, and uh, you know there will be a way to to beat this disease. I'm certain. I know, I know last night you were, you guys, like, you were feeling it last night, you, you were getting real emotional, and I was, yeah. um, yeah, I was thinking to myself, I was wondering, kind of, if it was because of, like, Hope and Steve, or, if, you know, I was thinking maybe your mom, you know? Yeah, my brother talked to my mom, and, and he was like, it's good to talk to mom, and she's asleep, and, and uh, maybe call her later, you know, and then. Last night, man, I just felt like I'm not ready to call her yet. And and, uh, and then I just woke up this morning and I started talking to my son about his situation. And I told him how we, you know, we all teamed up last night. And we're, I told him how much, how much care you guys are putting 
to make the music. You know, uh, it's the kind of music that he likes, you know. You just don't ever think that you, you know, just never think that your kid is that you would ever, you know, like live longer than your kid, you know. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't even imagine that. My son's a beautiful kid, man. He's, you know, he doesn't deserve to be, you know, he should, he's a freshman in college. He should just be like going, yeah. you know, chasing his dreams and, you know, partying on the weekends and doing stuff, you know, but, and he is, you know, but he just has to bring in the back of his head, like every day he's got to like check his breath, blood pressure. Make sure he's taking the medication he's supposed to take, and then if he forgets or something, he feels shitty about it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, So, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, what are you saying, man? Um, we kind of, we kind of have this like little rule in our house, like that nobody cries alone. So it's like, if anybody's crying, yeah, you, so you like, you like, you gotta put a hand up, you know, like nobody. You know. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. Like, that's great. You know. I love that. Yeah. And some of the last line but nobody cries alone. Love that. Can you try it? Try, try, just try some keys so I can find. <coughs> Put some kind of like nouns in there so that would be metaphors for it. You know, so like, like the fire and the rain type of yeah, thing. yeah, 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 or, yeah, like yeah, the mountains. And they're like, oh, going. Through. It could be it, whatever. Maybe not mountains. Yeah, it's you, a little I, more personal, but totally. Or, in the dark, in the darkness of the years, like the candle holding the light. I made it through, I'll be there through the night. That's right. I made it through. I love that. I love it. Nobody Just tag that last line. Yeah. Or, or, we, or we ended on the the main, the main harmony thing. I love it being vulnerable, though. It's stripped yeah. it all down to nothing where it's just saying, Nobody cries. Yeah. Candle holds the light. I'll hold you through the night. I made it. Nobody cries alone. I'll be shining alone. All alone. Like a starlight to guide you home. That's why I need to do that in the progression too, right? Nobody cries alone. Nobody cries alone. I remain. Cause nobody cries alone.
us have in life is what we feel. And it's the thing that we're born with. And it's the last thing that we have when we leave. And the hardest thing in my life has been coming face to face with the things that I fear the most, like losing the people that are closest to me, uh, not feeling wanted or appreciated, or not accomplishing the things that I set out to do in my life. When I write songs, it's like I give myself a chance to look my fears right in the eye. I, I feel them and I speak them out loud through music. And, and after I give them voice, I always feel better. And I feel stronger and more able to take on whatever challenge is coming next in my life. You know, other than music, the only other place that I can make sense of things is in nature. And um, I love coming out because it grounds me and it helps me to find balance in times when my world is like totally feels crazy. Nature has a way of surprising you. And during a time when I was really questioning my purpose, I came across a man and a group of people in Indonesia who shared their way of connecting people, planet, and music in a way that helped me to reconnect with the reason I make music in a way that I could have never imagined. When most people think about sustainability, it's just the trees growing quick enough to supply the demand. But really, sustainability is much more about socially having stability. And then from that social stability, economic stability with natural systems. And then from there, if, if they're socially stable and economically stable, ecological sustainability is very easy. And ecological stability and harmony with the community. So my name is Arif Rabik, and I'm a surfer. I'm an environmentalist, and I grew up in the island of Bali. My mother, Linda Garland, she was a very passionate, frontline, almost rebellious environmentalist who was constantly taking my brother and I to many parts of Indonesia to really see and open our eyes to the environmental problems. And ever since then, I guess it's been in my heart and in my DNA to really see how can bamboo truly become an alternative timber that's accepted by the timber market. So, Reef, why bamboo? Well, Indonesia is one of the Earth's three important lungs. It gives oxygen to the world. And since the 1960s, the Indonesian government really pushed for uh, whole log exports. And so they were deforesting, you know, two to three million hectares per year. And so the people really struggled because of that. Uh, economically, socially, and politically, because of the degradation of the landscape and the environment. And how much of the forest is gone here in Flores? More than 90% of the old growth forest is, has been logged. So this deforestation causes, of course, things like climate change. But much more importantly, and what a lot of people do forget, is that it affects communities where the forest used to be who used to live off the forest products and non-timber forest products. And it leaves many of these rural areas completely degrading. Tapi sekarang, uh, dengan adanya Mas Arif datang ke sini, misalnya, uh, lenga ini sebelum digunakan, diawetkan dulu. Yeah. Diawetkan dulu. So he's saying that uh, many people, they go to uh, far away from here to Kalimantan, uh, to find work um, because there's not enough work here. And uh, he thinks that with the 
the, the community-based forestry program that we're doing, uh, they will be able to find work here and they will be able to live from this land. So what we're doing here is we are taking bamboo and working it into a industrial system that links with forest community-based forestry, creates more jobs and takes the bamboo and creates a timber product that's harder than ironwood, lasts longer, and a typical contractor can build anything from a house, a commercial building, even up to multi-story buildings. So we're truly creating a preserved and durable timber replacement. So Reef, how do you guys process the raw bamboo? So basically we start in the forest, we cut it in five meter lengths, we send it here, cut it to 2.5 meter lengths, we split it into small little strips, goes through the slicer machine, separates the skin from the meat that we use, goes through the stranding machine, breaks it up into small little strands, we cook it in the carbonizing tank, dry it, take the strips from the factory in the forest, we dip it into emulsion bath, we dry the polymer so it kind of consolidates, and we press it with 3,600 tons of pressure. Cook it at about 130 degrees for like 12 to 14 hours, and then we slice it up like toast to make the flooring plank. That is a sustainable forestry product that keeps the culture alive. The most advantageous thing about bamboo is that it's a grass. Grasses grow at rates that are much quicker than other plants. Bamboos can grow up to two meters in 24 hours. It's just so rapidly renewable. And it also has very long and strong fibers, which has many different applications. And how does the bamboo grow? In the root system between the bamboos and all the different clumps, they all work together. They synergize, and I guess it's kind of like society and humans, you know? If they work together, they all get more water, more nutrients, they grow better, grow stronger. If they don't work together, they all die off slowly. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> for, for the bamboo yeah. and for us. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Many people did think I was completely crazy, working with bamboo, all of its issues and all of its fallbacks. But we knew the way, and we knew the technology worked. So we were passionate, and we really did work day in and day out to really show to everybody that this method was feasible. Our men and women are passionate about working here because they have an asset that they're working that is from their own land that is making them a livelihood. And also it's something for the future generations. And so they understand that this is something that can last. Understanding how harmony is achieved is really important. With the modern generation of the people here, um, they've forgot that. And so now through the few village elders and the few wise men in the village, we're bringing that back through a modern community-based forestry system that reinvents the, the traditional knowledge so that the new generation understands how to harmonize with the bamboo. Music has been passed down through generations in Vogel culture. Johannes is the principal songwriter of today, and he invited me to sit in with their choir. I'd spend half my life making music I hope would move other people, but somewhere along the way, I'd forgotten how much music could move me. Seconds. If I'm gonna die tonight, I want heaven. Hey, hey, with you, 
It's 11.59 and 59 seconds. If I'm gonna die tonight, I want heaven. Hey, hey, with you. We're singing Gloria, Gloria. It's 11.59 and 59 seconds. If I'm gonna die tonight, I want heaven. Hey, hey, with you. It's 11.59 and 59 seconds. If I'm gonna die tonight, I want heaven. Hey, 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 with you, we're singing Gloria, 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 Gloria. Can you, can you tell them that uh, uh, sometimes I, I start to lose faith? And today I feel like... They made my, my faith be <laughs> restored my faith. Pak Michael mau sampaikan bahwa kadang-kadang dia kurang semangat dan rasa bahwa kita tidak punya masa depan. Tapi hari ini dengan dia lihat teman-teman. Dia tugas apa di sana? Dia penyanyi. Penyanyi. Aku juga penyanyi. They asked, uh, uh, what is your profession? I said, you're a singer. And they said, we are singers too. Ini hanya bisa tahu bahasa Inggris. When I was a little. Yeah, let's try this one. Hey, hey. Here we go. Ready? No, we spoil it. I say, hey, I'll be gone today, but I'll be back coming around the way. Seems like everywhere I go, the more I see, the less I know. But I know one thing, that I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. At times it's hard to understand the effect you have on other people until you feel the effect they have on you. Being surrounded by the music of the Vogo tribe made me feel the power of music once again. I'm not just writing it and performing it myself, but having my heart ripped open by the passion in their voices. And in that moment, it made me realize again the way that my music can make other people feel. And if writing songs is my way of letting out what's in my heart or what I'm fearing or feeling, my joys, my celebrations, then performing music for others is my way of connecting to their hearts, a way to help others open up to what's happening in their lives and to be able to find their power again. I want my music to be a tool to bring joy, or to bring optimism, to bring courage and enthusiasm for life, and my weapon to speak truth to power when called upon. And sometimes it's about sharing it one on one. So I'm gonna go visit my mom. And it's been about three weeks since she had a stroke. And she doesn't have the energy she normally does on the phone, but um, I'm gonna go sing her a song that she inspired. So. I remember when I was just a boy. Mama said, this world is not always a paradise. There are things we try to take away your pride. Sometimes you know to show your love, you've got to fight. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah. she said to never run away. You got to stand up tall and look him in the eye. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. I will survive another day. I will hold on to this light until the day I die. But don't you give up on me. And I won't give up on you. And do you have faith in me? Because you know 
now that I still believe in what we've got. One love, one life, throw your hands up high. Cause all I'm trying to do is stay human with you. One love, one life, throw your hands up high. Cause all I'm trying to do is stay human with you. Thank you. Beautiful. That's your song. My song. <laughs> you know, something I always wanted to share with you about dad mm -hmm. was that one time we went out to lunch and he said, you know, I'm really sorry for all the things that I ever did to hurt you and to hurt mom and yeah. hurt anybody else in the family when I was drinking. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that because for you know, a long time, I carried just a lot of pain about being adopted and growing up with dad and he, you were always there to support me. And I just wanted you to know that before he died, I that I had forgiven him. Good. And that we had, and that he had really, you know, reached out to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it really changed, you know, changed my life. And yep. I just wanted you to know that. Well, thank you for telling me. Yeah, he always was very proud of me. I love this picture because you guys look so happy. Yeah. And dad was always so stoic in photos, you know. He's, he'd see him smiling. Like this that. is nice. You know, when I was a kid, most of the time I saw my dad as being this man who was really cold and hurtful but um, as he got older he changed and just like my mom he had a stroke and somehow um, in a weird way being sick actually made him well and he blossomed into this really beautiful person he stopped drinking he made amends to everybody in his life who he'd ever heard including me and I really got to see for the first time in my life how people have this incredible capacity to change. And ever since then, I've been inspired by the stories of how people overcome challenges and grow in ways that at first seem completely impossible. I went to South Africa for the first time and I met two people who really allowed me to step into their lives. Busasiwe Vasi and Sive Mazzino. And I saw how music, just like it had for me, inspired their change. Busi and Sive are both students at the Ubuntu Center, which is really a beacon of light in the struggling Zvide township of Port Elizabeth. This is going to be a beautiful day for all of us. At Ubuntu, our main focus is on the most vulnerable children. You know, we've got early childhood development, which is a solid foundation for our children. And then once they graduate from early childhood development, they go to a school. And then we still look after them. They come back to us to get extra lessons on math and science, to get skills, you know, I'm cooking and other stuff. Then once they graduate uh, on grade 12, they actually go to university. We also advocate for them to actually get to find better jobs. jobs, yeah. We take children from cradle to career. Good to see you, eh? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, So, So this is your neighborhood? Yes. This is my house uh, where I'm living in, and this is our living room yeah. where we live in with my sisters. We are three, mm -hmm. and then uh, we have also the small child. Mm -hmm. We are 
sleeping on the same bed mm -hmm. and sometimes I face down, sometimes I face there because uh -huh. we can't be four here. Yes. The child must sleep here and the two and then one. We share everything. Yeah. This is our books. We mm -hmm. like to read uh, the books that uh, encourage us. Where is, it, where is your mother and father? Okay, um, my mother passed away in 2015. Um, we used to actually live with my mom. And how did your mother pass away? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> she got a diabetic, she got a HIV, AIDS, she got a, uh, arthritis. Um, she was abused by my father. Because of that situation, my mom had to go to, to, to her home, mm -hmm. yeah, where she was born. And then it's when uh, everything got bad and worse. I had to ask for a leave at, at work. And then I went to see her, and then she was laughing on all that. The other time I was going to see her again, and then they, they, they told me that she passed away. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. How old was she when she passed away? Um, she was um, 40. 40. Yes, wow. yes. Sometimes life uh, hit on... Uh, sometimes you didn't expect this to, to be on this way that you wanted to be. Yes. yes. As I was a security, that money was not enough for my family. Uh, I sell myself secretively where no one is seeing me. I will just go to a guy and tell him that I am doing this, but not in an exposable way, but in a secretive way. And I believe I am not the only one because of the challenges that we face here. Sometimes you'll just end up doing what uh, you don't want to do just to survive, yes, just to survive. I said, it's enough now. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to live this life because it's my life that I'm destroying and I'm still young and I have also a child to take care of. When I was studying at Ubuntu, they were preparing us how to manage yourself in the world of work. And then I started that business of selling chicken. So I started my own business. Nice. Yes. My mom was a good listener. She will tell you whatever you do in life, you must always focus you must keep your mind on what you really want to be. I really miss her. Sometimes I, I feel like crying alone because um, she was my, my, my everything, actually. She was the one who told us how to, to be, believe in ourselves, how to become who we want to be. Uh, this was my mom's favorite song. In 1991, Nelson Mandela was released after 27 years of imprisonment, ending the rule of the white-only, violently oppressive apartheid government. Black South Africans finally had the right to vote for the first time, and Mandela was elected president and the leader of the African National Congress Party, who told South Africans living in the most impoverished communities, known as townships, that they would be moved out of shacks and into brick homes with electricity and hot running water. Decades later, the majority of South Africans living in the Port Elizabeth townships 
are still waiting for the homes promised to them. Uh, this place is called Fast Up. Most of the people here are waiting. Okay, let me say not most. All of the people here are waiting for the government to build us houses. This is where we used to live. Okay. We just moved last year. So this was your home here? This was my home. It was a three-room shack. When you guys came here, did you build the house? Yeah, we built it. It was when we came here, it was this room. Yeah. And then um, my stepfather added some two more rooms here. This was my mother's room. Uh -huh. And this was a kitchen with the lounge at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this was our room. How is it that you would get materials? We, uh, we like gather materials, whatever material we can find around the neighborhood, wherever. Yeah. And others, because they don't have money to go to the baby to the hardware to buy fresh material, mm -hmm. so they steal from one another. So they'll just go up there yeah, and just pull a piece off. If you know off that, okay, you are house. not there. We just go up there and peel that piece to fill up my piece, and then I will yeah. paint it. You won't notice. Yeah. Yeah. So things like that. Everyone is using this tap to get water. You lift it up, and then you put your like your 20 liter, okay. 20 liter bottle, and then the water will come out there. And then when you close it, you just close it like this, put it there. We don't have a place like a place to study. Uh, sometimes I'll wait for my brothers to go to sleep, and then I will come to the lounge alone. I will study here. We are four brothers, yeah. so we slept on the same bed. We never complained about it. Instead, it brought us closer, talk and share things. Yeah. What kind of so, things would you talk about? Uh, we talk about the future. This is a rap song. It has a line that says, uh, you will remember we are still growing up. We used to live like this. And I used to tell you that we won't die here. So that's what we used to talk about. Say, no, we won't die here. We'll move out here. We are, we are so sure about that. Yeah. We are 100% sure. For youth, it's not, uh, it's not quite good. If I have a child, I won't allow a child to grow up here. But we can't control where we are born. Yeah. If you're born here, you're born here. Yeah. But it's not, it's not good. It's, not, it's really not good. Sometimes an innocent person can get affected. Maybe like yeah. we are passing and then there's a gang fighting there. And then we get a bullet that was not meant for us. If I can count people who like made it coming from here, it's, it's only a few. At Ubuntu, there's a line they use there that they don't let your birthplace determine your future. Yeah, yes. Like, so I, 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 I hold on to that line a lot. We never thought we were going to survive here. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we will be survived. Right, let's get a haircut, man. <laughs> Did you ever imagine growing up that you'd go to university? Did you ever think about that, or was that just yeah. something that you learned when you got to Ubuntu? This was part of me since I was a kid that, okay, now I'll go to university. Even my mama was pushing me. It was part of, it was part of me. It was part of me since I was a kid. How do I look? Good. Younger? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I look like a rapper. <laughs> yeah. After studying by kerosene lamp, in a shack for his entire childhood. And with the help of the Ubuntu Center, Sive applied and was admitted to Port Elizabeth University. During his last year in school, his family finally moved into the home they'd been waiting for, ever since the end of the apartheid regime. So this is it? This is it. This is the house. This is my wow. brother. What's his name? Little Little Sam. Stage name, Dynasty. Stage name Dynasty. He's a rapper. He's a rapper also. Right on. You have a refrigerator. Yeah. You got a microwave. microwave. You got a stove. Just two old plate. Washing machine. Washing machine. None of this in the old house, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give me a tour. Okay, so this is the lounge. Yeah. So we watch TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have our favorite show, which is Generations. It plays at eight. So at eight o'clock, we'll all be here. Everybody. Everybody. So this is our bathroom. Something that we never had. So it's kind of exciting. To this, have a is, bathroom. Yeah. this is your favorite room in the house. <laughs> <laughs> My whole house back in first up, we use this. So now we are privileged. We can use the bar. Now, what does education mean to? You? growing up in this community, what, how important is it to you? Uh, the Mandela is, is, has a saying that says education is the, um, is the weapon to change the nation. So, so I, I really value education, and I believe we can change the world if we really value education. Even if we are not interested in the corporate world, maybe you are interested in the art. Like for myself, I, I want to be a professional musician. 
you still need education, it's still not the basic. I have this dream of mine to have a lot of businesses here. Yeah. One day I can manage my own record label, you see, and manage my own other businesses. I keep on telling my brothers, you have to, even, yeah, they're so into, they're so into into music as well, like I am, but I keep on telling them that education is number one, education is key, and then you can focus on music. This is my brother, man. This is my life, man. This is the reason why I'm focused on the grind, man. Uh. Yo, hey. Here comes the boom, here comes the dude. I'm feeling in my crew. People are cruel, cruel. From brandy to whiskey, from champagne to wine. I'm busy leaving, I don't have time to cry. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got my own space, something I always wanted. You, now you have the main house over there, which is like brick, modern, but you're still living in back here in a tin roof. So what does yeah. that mean to you? To me, it's more like uh, I'm glad, I'm happy, because uh, this is where all the studying happens and all the, the, the creation of ideas about my music and the, creation, and the creation of my future, the planning of my future, it happens all here. Before I study, I listen to music. And then after that, I will put my phone away and then focus on the book. And then I will study and study and study for an hour or two, three hours. And then when I'm taking a break, Music is my break, then get back to studying again. I focus on my future and focus on the fancy cars and see me driving fancy cars and see myself on those big houses. Now I'm kind of forgetting about the pain. So that's how music plays in my life. Yeah, if the world was to just shut down music, we will be like, I think it will be the end of me. Uh. Uh, every day when I wake up, I pray up. I gotta thank my maker for the days that I live up. I'ma grind harder, I'ma strive harder. Nothing will stop me until I get the BMW that I over want. Until I get the class craving setting that I always want. Until I go to United States, until I visit French and be part of the French man. I'ma grind up, uh, I'ma strive up, I'ma strive harder. Nothing will stop me until I get the beautiful wife that I always ever want. Until I get the multiple awards, man. Until I get those Grammy awards that I always ever want. Until I make a feature with Jay Z. Until I made the feature with Kanye West, I will wind up. Uh, I will live up every time when I wake up in the morning, I pray up. I pray for more hustle, I pray for more change to go up. Uh, every day when I wake up, I pray up. Thanks to Christ, man. Four, five, six. So when you first moved here, you, you know, you moved into this. Yes. The shake was not, was not done yet. Even this part was not, was not there. So we were like in the bed, lying in the bed. But when you look in the sky, it's just... There's no roof, you only see stars. So those things are inspiration, they are motivations to, to keep going, to keep grinding. And someone else might, might, uh, might be motivated by that kind of story. And make sure that every youth, every young child, every young black child gets to, to hear those sort of stories. And they can, so they can believe that a black child can make it no matter what.
You, I'm so proud of you. Really, I'm proud. I even feel you. I can't tell how I feel. I'm proud of you. Really. Thank you, ma'am. Congratulations. I know for sure I have confidence in that kind of story which will touch uh, someone's life. Yes, and even now, now, even everything is done. There's a roof here, there's a roof here. So everything is sorted, but I, I, I like to go outside at night and just look at the stars. So because those stars remind me of that day. My big point is that it's the little things. That's it. It's like little things in life like Hope and Steve caring for each other. Or Robin making a mother and child feel safe right from the start. And there's a reef helping people to feel a sense of pride in what they do. Or Boosie and Sive persevering no matter what. Those are the things that help me get through life. They remind me of what it means to be at your best as a human being. The world is made up of millions of people doing millions of little things to make a difference. And I want to stoke those flames. Even if it's just for one show or one song or three minutes while somebody's on the bus listening to their headphones. I want to make music that reminds people of the importance of the little things. The little things that make all of us human. And I guess what I've learned so far is that the search of discovering how to stay human is really a journey of understanding who you are as an individual in relationship to the rest of the world. The way you were born, how you were raised, the challenges you faced, the dreams you dreamed, the falls you took, the way you got back up and the way you gave back to the world. No one is born perfect. And that is the one thing that unites all of us. And we learn from our struggles. So maybe our struggles are our greatest gifts because they help us to shine light on the beauty that we could never see before, but that was always there. Because we are what we search for. So if we search for fear, hatred, and darkness, we will find those things. But if we search for courage, strength, friendship, or love, we will find them as well. None of us really have a choice to stay human or not. As long as our heart is beating, we will be human. So the choice we really have is what kind of human do we want to be? So with all of the challenges that we all face every day, maybe the best way to stay human is to find the ability to see the human in others.